On October the 31st, 1517, Martin Luther posted 95 big questions which he believed faced the church of his day to a local church door in Wittenberg, Germany. 500 years later, I decided to post 95 new questions, one a week, to the web, questions which I believe the church must face in the 21st century. Question 86. When Paul used the word all, did he really mean all? Would the God of love, who's described as the definition of pure love, punish people with infinite eternal torment, all based on decisions and actions taken in their few short years of life on earth? What kind of parent would having sought to build a relationship with their children, suddenly call time switch and then inflict agony and torture on them. The truth is that we all know that if we had evidence of a parent, any parent, behaving in this way, we'd have a civic duty to report them to the police or the social services immediately. It's often claimed that the New Testament's very clear that when people reject God, who Jesus described as a father, God, out of love, because love always grants you your own way, honours that decision. But this week, we're going to take a look at what the Apostle Paul, that passionate follower of Christ, had to say about all of this. First, like we've already seen, the term hell has no place at all in Paul's message. He never uses it in any of his writing. In fact, if Paul did believe in hell, he either forgot to mention it or decided to keep his belief a big secret from everyone else. But it's not as though Paul avoids the subject of life beyond this one. He sets out his thinking on the subject in a number of key passages. And in one of the most important contained in chapter 5, verses 12 to 19 of his letter to the infant church in Rome, he compares what he calls the effects of the sin of Adam to the impact of the sacrifice of Christ. He explains, first referring to Adam, that just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act, now referring to Christ, resulted in justification and life for all people. Various preachers have sought to dismiss what, in my view, is the obvious force of Paul's argument by interpreting that all in the second clause one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people to mean nothing more than, as they put it, Jews and Gentiles alike without distinction rather than everyone without exception. In that way, the claim is that all only means some individuals from both groups get saved rather than everyone in both groups. But the word all cannot have one meaning in the first part of Paul's sentence and then a different definition in the next. To teach this, as is sometimes done, renders, in my view, any understanding of anything Paul ever wrote impenetrable because it's to conclude that he's so inconsistent with his words that they might mean anything he chooses in any particular moment, unrelated to anything else he chose for them to mean a moment earlier. Either Paul believes that eventually all will enjoy God's presence because of Christ, or if he doesn't, he uses such misleading language to tell us so that it becomes almost impossible to take seriously a word of what he says anywhere else. And it's not a one-off. He does it again in his first letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 15, verse 22. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. Whatever the fancy exegetical footwork, in the end you have to do one of two things. Either conclude that Paul was so loose with his choice of language as to be irresponsibly vague and misleading around the articulation of his central message, or accept that he meant very deliberately to say exactly what he did say. He really is talking about good news for all people. The way I see it, 
Paul's literary intention is clear and his logic simple. What God has already done for the Jewish people, he has now, through Christ, done for the whole world. Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, is now Lord of the whole world. Paul's convinced. Saul, the fundamentalist, nationalist Pharisee, has become Paul, the great includer, the great universalizer. He's discovered that this good news is not just for his tribe, his tribe alone, it's for the whole world. It is cosmic and he's very keen to let everyone know. His message is clear to everyone whose question has ever been, does God believe in me? The answer is a definitive 100% yes. For everyone who's ever felt that the door of God's acceptance was slammed in their face, Paul is equally clear. Christ has revealed that, in actual fact, the door has been flung wide open to you. It's a revolution and it leads to a huge but inescapable question. How could parts of the church have got it all so wrong? I explore this issue more deeply as well as many others raised by the Apostle Paul's writing in my new book, The Lost Message of Paul. You can purchase your paperback copy today from openchurch.network slash lost message of Paul or from any good bookshop. An ebook and an audio book are also available from Amazon as well as from other online retailers.